Is Tyree Wilson the perfect project for the Falcons to take in round one? And could the team circle back to pursue Lamar Jackson later this offseason? It's Mock Draft Monday, guys. Let's get it. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, guys, you know me. I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black, and your very humble host, man, here on this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family, your team every day. And I want to thank everyone that makes Locked On Falcons their first listen each and every day. Of course, it's free and available Monday through Friday on a variety of podcast platforms, including on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and you will get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio drops. And make sure you check us out on your Roku and Amazon Fire TV by downloading the Locked On Sports Atlanta app on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. So it is Mock Draft Monday. It is also a mailbag Monday. We'll answer a couple of listener questions, including whether or not the Falcons Falcons could revisit Lamar Jackson, not only at a future date this offseason, but perhaps next year. But let's get into the mock draft Monday portion of today's episode where we examine a recent mock draft to really look at a prospect that the or the Falcons are projected to take in round one and take a deep dive on that guy. And this mock draft comes from Dane Brugler of The Athletic. He did a top 10 mock on Friday after the Panthers traded up with the Bears for that number one overall pick. Eighth pick, the Atlanta Falcons select Tyree Wilson, defensive end from Texas Tech University. And the thing you like about Tyree Wilson, he's a long, lanky, explosive pass rusher in terms of a guy that gets off the bus looking very, very promising. 6'6", 271 pounds, 35 and 5 eighths eighth inch arms that's 96 percentile among pass rushers uh, according to mock draftable.com didn't get an official listing of his wingspan but it's projected at 80 over 86 inches which according to mock draftables database uh, th- that would make him basically the fourth l- in the top four uh, among all players in terms of overall wingspans as they only have three guys currently that have 86 or longer uh, arms in terms of wingspan And the thing that stands out about Wilson when you pop on the film is he has very heavy hands. And what that means is, you know, he is going to move guys off the ball, especially when he's rushing on the interior uh, against guards. His bull rush is is, is going to get movement every single time time and he has the tools to develop other moves but he isn't quite there yet and we'll circle back to that a little bit later when we talk about some of the concerns with Wilson but he has the ability to line up on a multitude of areas on your defensive line he can play on the edge he can play inside he can play that five technique role Uh, and especially for a team like the Falcons who uh, supposedly want to play continue to play with these hybrid fronts that versatility is going to be very valuable when the Falcons go to their four three looks he can play on the edge on rundowns he can kick inside on passing situations if they want to play three four he can play that five technique role for a traditional defensive end uh and so there's a scenario where you can get him as well as several of the other falcons top players like grady jarrett like taquan graham uh arnold abiketti and lorenzo carter all on the field at the same time hopefully we'll be seeing the falcons add to that group uh over the next couple of days and weeks um, to see who their top pass rushers, but certainly I think Wilson, uh, regardless of where you want to, he can kind of be that movable chess piece and you can kind of fit him in where you need to fit him in. And again, 6'6", 271, 35 and 5 eighths inch arms. We've seen a lot of guys getting off the bus that are this type of size that go very early in the draft. You look at some several number one overall picks, Trevon Walker, uh, Miles Garrett, Jadavion Clowney, all these guys were 6'4 or taller. Um, Clowney was 6- 266, Walker and Garrett were 272, they, but they both had over 35-inch arms. Clowney was 34 and a half. You had Ziggy Ansah, very similar size to both Walker and Garrett, 6'5", 271, 
over 35 inch arms. He was the fifth overall draft selection. Alden Smith was number seven overall, 6'4, 263, over 35 inch arms. Chandler Jones, uh, 21st overall several years ago, 6'5, 266, over 35 inch inch arms. And then you have Emmanuel Ogba, who was number 32 overall, the first pick in round two, 6'4, 273, with over 35 and a half inch arms. And so the point is that these are the types of pass rushers that often get highly coveted in the draft. And so when Daniel Jeremiah of NFL.com, a few weeks back sort of discuss how some teams have Tyree Wilson rated over Will Anderson and then proceeded to mock Wilson uh, in a mock draft to Arizona at the number three overall selection and Will Anderson out of Alabama, uh, number five overall to the Seattle Seahawks in his mock draft. That caused a mini uproar on the internet, but it, it kind of made sense to me, not saying that I would personally rate Wilson over Anderson, but it, it makes sense. And as a DJ later explained, if you value traits, if you value upside, it's a similar conversation that led to Trayvon Walker leapfrogging more polished pass rushers like Aiden Hutchinson last year and Kayvon Thibodeau last year. Uh, if you believe in, in Wilson, you know, being a relatively raw player and believing that, you know, his future in the NFL is going to be a lot brighter than what you saw at the collegiate level, it makes sense. And this is something that we discussed over the weekend on the Discord, uh, doing one of our Saturday symposiums, which is basically a Twitter space for the Discord this past weekend. And I, I kind of jokingly, you know, and I, you know, I like to be a little spicy with some of these takes. I, I called Will Anderson a fraud, and I don't necessarily mean that. You know, I got to be spicy when I say stuff. But a lot of I went back and charted Will Anderson's production this past year, and a lot of his production this year as well as last year uh, came on unblocked plays, cleanup plays, stunts plays. Right, you know, of his ten sacks, I only charted six of them where he actually beat an offensive lineman that weren't unblocked, weren't cleanup plays, weren't stunt plays. I charted six other quarterback hits that he had. Only one of them saw him beat an offensive lineman. And so one of the things I do want to do at a later date, probably when we get closer to the draft, is go through some of these top edge rushers and chart, you know, how they got their production in terms of sacks, hits, TFLs, how they won, where they won, all that stuff and more. But I'm, my guess is that Wilson probably had a higher percentage uh, where he was actually beating offensive linemen to get his uh, production as opposed to Will Anderson. And then you look at the PFF metrics, uh, you know, and, and Daniel Jeremiah kind of touched upon this, that, you know, with a player like Walker, who was much, much lower in terms of his production, that's not an issue with Tyree Wilson, right? You look at PFF's pass rush productivity, productivity metric, which is basically their per snap uh, pressure sort of breakdown. And you compare Wilson to the other nine edge rushers that are in Daniel Jeremiah's top 50 rankings uh, as of this recording. Uh, and of those guys, Wilson had the second highest pass rush productivity among those guys, only behind Georgia's Nolan Smith. And then you look at um, – his no, his win rate was the second highest uh, behind Nolan Smith, but his pass rush pro productivity on a per snap basis was actually the highest of that 10 edge rusher group. And then when you look at true pass rushing downs or true pass set downs, right, where PFF basically takes out screens, the rollouts, play action, they take off like um, three man rushes, they take off plays that have less than two seconds uh, of time to throw or more than four seconds. So when the quarterback, you know, holds onto the ball too long. And you look at those situations, uh, Tyree Wilson's pass rush productivity was third among these 10 edges behind only Will McDonald of Iowa State and Lucas Van Ness of Iowa. And it was second behind McDonald in terms of these true pass rush downs in terms of win rate uh, in those situations. And so the point is that he's basically more productive if you buy into the PFF metrics than Will Anderson across the board. Now, I think you can easily argue, and I probably would also argue this, that some of that is owed to playing going up against SEC offensive linemen versus uh, Big 12 offensive linemen. Um, but the idea that some teams out there, again, not me, but other teams out there might value Wilson a little bit more than Anderson is not crazy to me, especially if you're a team like we assume the Falcons are going to be. And again, not suggesting that the Falcons would value Wilson over Anderson, but maybe you never know. Um, and, you know, if you're a team that wants to play with lighter boxes, which is kind of the new thing in the NFL where teams are sort of designing their defensive scheme to stop the pass and not necessarily loading up against the run like we have traditionally seen defenses do throughout NFL history, you know, where it's stop the run first and pass second. 
you know, nowadays, this is why the Fangio defense has sort of taken the league by storm. It's much more geared towards let's stop the pass first and stop the run second. And that leads to playing with lighter boxes. You need bigger guys to kind of compensate for the fact that you're not going to have the numbers count in the box. And so a 271 pound Wilson is probably going to be a lot more intriguing to you if you want to play that style of defense than a 253 pound Anderson. So we are going to continue talking a little bit about Wilson and some of the concerns, despite the tools that he has uh, and sort of discuss sort of how long it's going to take for him to impact in the league, that if he's a bit of a project that may take a little bit longer for him to potentially develop. But guys, before we get there, I want to tell you that today's episode is brought to you by the ultimate football GM. And you've heard me talk about this fun new mobile game. And as the Falcons are gearing up to make their moves later this week, you can make your own moves, build your own dynasty, manage every strategic aspect of your team, hiring coaches, coordinators, make trades, go through free agency, the draft and every up and down in the season. The you know, this is all in a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Football GM is completely free. It's playable offline, so you can play on the go as you want, when you want. I put the game down for a couple of weeks now. I've started to pick it back up to get geared up uh, for the next couple of days to get my sort of fix in terms of being that GNRO manager. And the thing about this game, I can attest why I put it down because I was so frustrated with how challenging the game. It took me several years just to have a winning season. It took me several years to uh, make the playoffs. Uh, I was trying to do the, let, let me build my team up first and, and then go get the quarterback. But, you know, I had to sort of switch that up uh, to go get the quarterback. And that kind of applies to what the Falcons are going on. So if you want to have your fun, uh, go on and check out this game and make sure you use the promo code locked on all in caps, L O C K E D O N in the game store, and you'll get a hundred percent free boost. And if you want to download the game, just go to ultimate dash GM.com or look it up in the app stores. That's ultimate dash GM.com ultimate football GM start your dynasty today. So I definitely can envision a scenario where the Falcons are taking Tyree Wilson in round one. We've been talking for like basically the last six weeks about the idea of the Falcons going corner at eight. Um, but I think in a world, especially in a world where the Falcons don't necessarily uh, hit that upgrade in free agency at, at edge, that they might be more attracted to a player like Wilson at the top of the draft. Uh, especially, you know, you wonder if the Falcons are going to be, you know, pursuing edge rushers this offseason now that they've re-signed Lorenzo Carter. That may suggest that the Falcons aren't necessarily expecting to get that big upgrade at edge. Players like Marcus Davenport, players like Jadavion Clowney that we've discussed. Obviously, Davenport has that Ryan Nielsen connection. Clowney kind of has a Nielsen connection because the Saints were very heavily pursuing Clowney ahead of the 2020 season before he ultimately chose to sign with the Browns. But I think in terms of the, that type of player, this big, long player, Wilson sort of fits that mold that we've seen the Saints very attracted to with guys like Cam Jordan as well over the years. And Wilson is just bigger, longer than even Clowney, Davenport, and even Cam Jordan at this point in time. But I do think that doesn't necessarily mean that Wilson is a slam dunk, right? The knocks on Wilson is despite his long length and lankiness, you know, he, he kind of, you know, lanky is the right word because he kind of is a little bit out of control at times. There's too often where he kind of gets off balance. He spends a little bit too much time on the ground than you necessarily would want to see in a pass rusher. Obviously, you're not going to be able to sack the quarterback if you're, you know, lying prone on the turf. Um, and it'll be interesting to go back and chart his production uh, later this offseason because I didn't see too many opportunities and too many reps where he was able to win on the outside. I went back and watched some film uh, earlier today before recording this to kind of refresh my memory uh, on Wilson. I did not see that many times where he was able to go up against a tackle and beat that guy uh, to the outside. I think he does have good bend for a player his size. I think he has the speed and burst to win on the outside, but he just doesn't consistently do it. And I think some of that is owed to, I don't know if he really has the refined footwork or the hand placement and technique to really uh, comfortably bend the edge. And and I think often he's laid off the snap and that's also holding him back in terms of being able to be that speed rusher on the outside. So I think while Wilson has the tools, he is fairly raw. And that is a concern because you do wonder how quickly he's going to produce in the NFL. When you compare him to some of these other guys like a Miles Garrett, a Chandler Jones, an Alden Smith, Ziggy Ansa, Jadavion Clowney, uh, Emmanuel Agba, you know, some of these guys were very productive right away in the NFL. Garrett, 
Chandler Jones, Alden Smith were very productive. Ziggy Anta was very productive as well before injuries kind of sapped him. And Anta was a guy that kind of just relied solely on those raw tools from the jump in the NFL. And I, I can recall specifically that London game against the Lions in 2014 where he gave Jake Matthews that work just basically because he's just bigger, longer, stronger than that. But notably among this group, Clowney and Agba kind of got off to relatively slow starts, right? And that's notable to me because of this group of players – Clowney and Agba had the slowest three cones. We've talked a little bit about the correlation between pass rush production, particularly looking at sack production uh, in the three cone, right? The lower that three cone, the faster that three cone is, the higher that uh, sack production tends to be among edge rushers in the NFL. Now, Miles Garrett didn't run a three cone. Um, you know, Trayvon Walker also had an incredible three cone, but it's a little too early to judge him. But notably of this group of players, Chandler Jones that we're talking about had the fastest three cone. and He was the most productive player right away in the NFL. If you look at his first four years of production in the NFL and sort of extrapolate his pressures and sacks on a 16 game basis. Right. He averaged about 10 and a half sacks and 59 pressures uh, per 16 games over the first four seasons of his NFL career. And you compare that to Clowney and Agba, who are at the bottom of this list of these players that were common comparing Wilson to Clowney averaged 6.8 sacks and 50 pressures over his first four years per 16 games. Agba was 5.8 sacks and 40 pressures over uh, the first four years of his NFL career. And I wonder if Wilson, when we project him, where does he kind of fit in? And so comparing him to these other guys in terms of the frame and body type, I want to compare him to him those athletically. So I'm very much looking forward to his pro day at the end of the month is scheduled at Texas tech at March 29th. And so I, I really want to, you know, I expect him to run fast. I expect him to be explosive in his jumps. I'm very curious to see what his agilities are. Does he have that high end agility or is he on the lower end of that? I, I expect him to test better than probably a lot of people would think in that regard. But you know, when you examine Clowney and Agba specifically, and I look at Wilson, I wonder the rawness, is he more comparable to a Clowney or an Agba than he is to a Chandler Jones or, or Miles Garrett or somebody like that. But we know Clowney's issues early in his career were injury related. Clowney's always been, you know, a number two. He's a high end number two pass rusher. He's never really proven himself despite all the hype he had coming into the NFL to be that number one guy. He's had one year where he was kind of the guy. And that was a year where JJ Watt was injured. I think it was 2017, if I'm not mistaken where Clowney had nine and a half sacks that year and 64 pressures. Uh, but then all of his other seasons, all two of them, where he's had eight or more sacks and 50 plus pressures, he was either the number two guy to J.J. Watt or the number two guy to Miles Garrett. And Agba is a notable player because he got off to a slow start, kind of bounced around the league a couple of years with Cleveland and Kansas City, then had his breakout year in Miami back in 2020. That was year five for Emmanuel Agba, had nine sacks, 66 pressures, followed that up with another nine sack season in 2021 and 61 pressures. And I think... You know, Agba is notable because he also of this group of players that we're talking about. I my recollection is that he probably spent a large chunk of his early career rushing on the interior, uh, similar to what we're talking about with Wilson, where that may be where he puts his best foot forward before you can develop some of that outside pass rush. And so I wonder a little bit if he's more comparable to Agba. Agba's notable because he's not the most explosive guy when it comes to rushing on the outside, but he wins with length, power. And he has a really nice cross chop that he used. And I think the, the fact that he took him a while to develop that sort of technical pass rush move like a cross chop is why it took him so long to develop in the NFL because it doesn't necessarily have the plus plus traits. You know, he has plus traits, but not plus plus traits to sort of just win with natural ability like a Ziggy Ansah, that type of player. And so it takes a while for to develop those moves and that technical things. And I wonder if Wilson's going to be on that track. I think he's probably got a little bit more of the plus plus athletic traits. And again, that's where the, the pro day testing is going to kind of inform us on that but he may take a little bit while uh, to develop and it may be year four year five he may be one of these guys similar to what we're talking about with marcus davenport where you're kind of hoping his second team is going to be a lot more productive uh than necessarily his first team although again davenport's production is a little bit better than both Clowney and agba on a per 16 game basis over the first four years, averaging about seven sacks and 52 pressures uh, compared to those two. So a little bit better than that. And so we'll see sort of where Wilson kind of slots in on that, but there's a lot of boom bust potential with Tyree Wilson. And so, it's understandable why I think a lot of people may look at him and be like, you know, I, I don't know about that guy. But I think with the Falcons, it's specifically because of the presence of Ryan Nielsen, because of your 
whether you trust him or not, or whether he's earned that trust or not, but at least his reputation as a developer of, you know, pass rushers, you feel maybe a little bit better about, you know, betting on the upside of a Tyree Wilson uh, compared to in the past when the Falcons have bet on these types of more athletic toolsy pass rushers uh, in the past. And, you know, I think Wilson, you know, you're, you're comparing him to like Vic Beasley and Tack McKinley are the players I'm referencing, but those guys were like six, two sub two fifty pass rushers. It's different when you're six, six two seventy plus. So I, I do feel like, you know, well, I wouldn't necessarily like I wouldn't sit here and say, hey, Wilson's a home run again. It's boom bust. Like he could be Emmanuel Agba. He could be Jadavion Clowney or he could be, you know, Ziggy Ansa, um, I won't say Chandler Jones, but like, you know, that type of, of impact player. But betting on the boom with Ryan Nielsen, I think, makes sense for the Falcons. So he makes a ton of sense for the Falcons. We will leave the mock draft portion of today's episode and move on to the mailbag, which is going to involve us. Uh, talking about whether or not the Falcons will circle back to Lamar Jackson. And we'll get into a little bit of a conversation of part of the reason why I am not panicking about the future of the Falcons quarterback situation that is related to that. And we'll get into that as we continue today's episode, but it is beyond the midway point of the NBA season, which is the perfect time to download FanDuel America's number one sports book. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That means if your first bet doesn't win, you get bonus backs, bonus bets back in up to $1,000. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. You can bet, you know, on the NBA point spreads, money lines. You can build yourself a parlay based off of rebounds, assists, and points and whatnot. I like looking at the prop bets for the NFL draft to see how those things are changing. You know, I already got money on like Will Levis being the number one overall pick. I probably need to put some money on CJ Stroud being that number one pick, all that and more. So go check it out, whatever you want to bet on NBA, NFL, et cetera, XFL. Use that no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. When you go to fanduel.com slash locked on, that's fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. So let's get into a quick couple of mailbag questions before we get into that Lamar Jackson um, conversation. And first comes from L in the Discord. He says, do you think Kendra Miller, the running back from TCU, would make a good pairing with Tyler Algier? Yeah, I like Miller. He's more of that slasher than Algier, but does have enough sort of speed and power to kind of be a solid one-two punch. Rise up from the Discord as, hey, Aaron, would love to hear your top three for every position in this upcoming draft. Thanks. Well, rise up. Sorry to disappoint you, but that's probably more of an April question. I'm not quite ready to, to do that. Uh, so we'll we'll punt that to maybe a month from now. Um, then we have an email from AJ uh, E. He says, Adam Thielen is not the burner we look for as a wide receiver too, but I still think he would be a good fit since he's a willing blocker while being a good route runner. Worst case is he's another good veteran to teach guys like London and Pitts. And yeah, I think you're, you know, if you're looking for veteran leadership, Thielen would be a, a good guy for that. But Thielen's kind of a declining player. You know, I hate to say that use the term washed, but looking at some of his production, especially in the second half of the year, uh, he looked a little bit washed because he was kind of the number four guy uh, to in Minnesota's offense, especially after they made the TJ Hawkinson trade that he was actually behind KJ Osborne uh, in terms of production over those last like nine, 10 games of the season. He's going to be 33 in August this year. He was healthy. He played every game, but the previous years he was dealing with a lot of injuries there. So if you're going to sign Adam Dean, I don't think you're signing him to be a number two. I think you're really signing him to be a number three at this point in time. So in a world where the Falcons don't resign Alameda Zacchaeus, I think, you know, Thielen might be worth visiting there. Um, but in this point in time, I think if you're expecting him to be more than like a number three wide receiver uh, and probably a fourth option in your passing attack, you may be a little bit disappointed with what Adam Thielen is going to bring to the table. So let's get into our final question. This comes from Sandox. What's the likelihood of Lamar not coming to terms with a few teams that can fulfill his contract or Baltimore? And we revisit the situation in the 2024 offseason. I feel like this team should be a lot more complete this time next year. So yeah, the Lamar situation is very interesting because um, it's a process that could play out over the course of several months, if not years, as you're intimating Sandox. Um, you know, hypothetically, and we stress the word hypothetically, right? You know, a team like the Atlanta Falcons could circle back to pursuing Lamar Jackson at a later date, despite sort of the initial indications being that, you know, they won't pursue him at this time. And I think part of that is just logistical where teams can't contact. I think we just learned over the weekend um, that, you know, teams can't really contact a franchise tag player like Lamar Jackson until the start of the year. 
uh, on Wednesday, on March 15th, because prior to that, that would probably be considered tampering. Again, I don't know exactly the rules, but that's my guess. And so had, you know, teams like the Falcons said, oh, we are 100% interested in Lamar Jackson, that would have been considered tampering. So that may be a factor on why teams said no. Another factor is teams in general don't like have to deal with offer sheets, right? And for those unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, because Lamar Jackson was franchise tag with the non-exclusive tag, uh, a, a, another team could come around and sign him to an offer sheet, basically sign him to a new contract. Uh, let's say hypothetically, you know, a team like the Falcons sign him to a four year, $200 million fully guaranteed contract. And Baltimore would then have five days to match that contract. And if they were to match him, it's essentially Baltimore signing him to a four year, $200 million contract. And if they don't match it they would get two first round picks back from the falcons and it for a team like the falcons why would they be interested in doing that because they would basically do all that work for nothing negotiating the deal for the ravens and it seems like a lot of people because of the expectation that lamar wants a fully guaranteed contract and if a team was successful at you know negotiating a contract for less than a fully guaranteed deal baltimore is expected to match that deal um and so I think that's leading to some of the stalemate that's going on right now. And this is also a factor in why you do not see restricted free agency being a significant thing in any off season. Like if you go to the Wikipedia page of restricted free agent, um, you know, I, all the examples they use are from like 15 years ago. And like, I, I can't think of the last time a, a restricted free agent changed teams. I'm sure there's been one or two examples in the last decade or so, but it, it doesn't happen very often. And that's a testament to why, you know, teams aren't necessarily chomping at the bit to go out there and offer an offer sheet because restricted free agent, like un, unlike unrestricted free agent is you have to do the similar thing where you offer an offer sheet. If the player agrees and the original team doesn't match, then you get, you know, potentially draft pick compensation, not two first round picks, usually a second or third or whatever. But, you know, the other factor that's holding back teams from going after Lamar is the notion that there's a five day waiting period and it kind of puts all of your free agent free agency on hold during that five days. Right. Because you can't necessarily proceed until I, I think that contract gets approved. And if you're a team like the Falcons and you want to go out there in the first couple of days of free agency and sign a bunch of players, hopefully, um, you know, that's not necessarily something that you're going to be rushing in to do with the Lamar Jackson situation and put the rest of your free agent hall on hold. And, you know, in a world where you, you do go after Lamar and you don't secure him, then Baltimore matches that offer sheet. The optics aren't great for that, right? Now, I don't think that's a massive issue, but it's it's going to be tough to be all in on Lamar Jackson, you know, strike out on getting him and then basically turning back to your locker room and be like, yeah, you know, we believe in you, Desmond Ritter, or we believe in you, other quarterback, uh, despite the fact that we basically were willing to pay a bajillion dollars to Lamar Jackson. And again, I don't, I don't think that's a huge issue or a huge deterrent for that, but it's just... It's, it's an awkward situation is, is basically. And so I don't think teams to avoid that awkwardness are going to rush into that situation. But I think hypothetically, you know, if you were a team like the Falcons that were eventually going to make a, a, a move for Lamar Jackson, you would probably wait until late March or early April to do so. Now, Personally, I don't think that a team like the Falcons would wait until after the draft to pursue Lamar because I just don't think, you know, that's a plan B situation, right? Why would you wait till after the draft to get your plan A at quarterback? And I don't think Lamar Jackson is anybody's plan B. He's either your plan A or you're not a plan at all, right? Uh, he's not like, well, you know, we struck out on these other th two or three quarterbacks and now I guess we can just go get Lamar Jack. Like, that's not how it works, right? So, um, you know, but it is possible for a team to wait until after the draft. Um you know, because I, 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 from what I understand, up until July 17th, another team could come and, and offer an offer sheet for Lamar Jackson at any point between now and July 17th or any point between Wednesday, March 15th and July 17th, and as well as possibly trade for Lamar Jackson. Like it doesn't you're not guaranteed that you have to uh, sign him to an offer sheet. You could negotiate a trade with Baltimore, which I assume you would have probably wind up giving up more than two first round picks in order for that to happen. But, you know. That's going to be a complicating factor. Another complicating factor is whether or not Lamar is going to play this year, right? You know, there's been a lot of speculation that he's not going to play on the tag. Um, I would understand if he chose not to do that. But if, you know, again, if Lamar is looking for advice from some random dude on the Internet, um, I would recommend him to play on the tag. You know, just wait. You know, you don't have to sign your offer sheet until, you know, training camp or whatever. Um, but, you, you know, you get a fully guaranteed contract uh, this year. Um, and then you play this game again next year, right? 
And if your goal is to find that fully guaranteed contract, as has been widely reported, um, just play the waiting game, Lamar Jackson, right? You know, basically, when we look at the history of the NFL, the quarterbacks or the players, because there's only been two quarterbacks that have been successfully able to get a fully guaranteed contract was Kirk Cousins and Deshaun Watson. And both of these guys, you know, were able to get do that because they were able to get into a bidding war. They were able to force a bidding war. And Kirk Cousins played this game before where he was tagged multiple times. And then the Washington team couldn't command um, commanders couldn't tag him a third time. And he hit unrestricted free agency and therefore was able to get that fully guaranteed deal from the Vikings a couple of years ago and so if you're lamar just just play the waiting game just keep playing on the tag and, until baltimore financially cannot tag you any longer and then you'll be an unrestricted free agent and then you can get your deal and that may be two years from now because this year he's going to play on the tag next year if they were to tag him again um you know it'll be i think about 39 million dollars uh which is probably doable but then the following year that would jump to i think 56 million dollars which Maybe doable, but it's borderline at that point in time. And so I think with Lamar, it's just patience, right? You just, I'll play on the tag. I'll get my $32 million guaranteed. I'll get my 39 gu guaranteed next year. And then eventually I will be able to quote unquote, get free and get that fully guaranteed contract once I can get to unrestricted free agency. So I do think there is definitely a scenario as you put out Sandox where the Falcons can re, you know, go back and circle back to this, Lamar situation next year where they presumably have a better roster uh, moving forward. And I think there'll be plenty of options potentially next year that may be available for a team like the Falcons if they choose to go and try to upgrade the the quarterback position with a more proven option. You have guys like Lamar Jackson. Um, I don't know if Trey Lance is going to be a more proven option, but he may be available on the market next year. Uh, Kyler Murray may be available via trade next year. Russell Wilson may be available via trade. Ty Ryan Tannehill could be available as well. And I think this speaks to what I've discussed a couple of times on the podcast, that this quarterback carousel that we've seen the last couple of offseason, I think this is going to be the new normal in the NFL for several years now, guys. And that's why I don't think the panic that a lot of Falcon fans have with, we got to get the quarterback right now, I personally think that's a little bit overblown because I think there will be more opportunities in the future than you would normally assume given the value of the quarterback position, right? And I feel like we've been moving in this direction for several years now where you've seen teams paying these premium for these quarterbacks, and I think teams are going to be less willing to do that. I think this is kind of going to be the direction and trajectory of the NFL that basically if you don't have one of these top five quarterbacks like a Patrick Mahomes, presumably a Joe Burrow, I don't that, you know, that is going to allow you to be a championship contender year after year. I don't know if teams are going to value playing the premium for guys that are below that tier moving forward. Right. You know, and. You know, you, you look at this, it's a similar situation that we discussed many times in the past with Matt Ryan, where we were paying a premium for Matt Ryan, and it wasn't because Matt Ryan was the problem. But I also talked about it, well, Matt Ryan isn't the solution. And that's what I mean, where, like, if we're paying a premium, we want our quarterback to solve the problem, which presumably talking about being a team that can be a perennial playoff team, being a team that can be perennial championship contender. And it's the notion I also brought up, which is like, why are you paying for cable if you're not watching cable? Right. So why are you paying a premium for a quarterback if you're not getting premium port quarterback production and getting the, the corresponding team success that you expect in that? And again, I think this has been a movement that's been picking up more and more steam the last couple of years. But because we are stuck in this past mindset of, oh, well, you got to have a top 10, top 12 quarterback, you know, that's not I don't think that's going to be the new normal in the NFL. And you've seen this for several years where teams are dumping expensive quarterbacks, right? You're seeing it this offseason. You've seen it recent off seasons, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Derek Carr are guys that are going to be moved on for potentially guys on rookie contracts this year in green Bay and uh, Las Vegas, you know, with signings with Daniel Jones and Geno Smith, those are basically one or two year contracts. These long-term deals that teams are going to have no more. Kirk cousins is another guy that probably will be potentially moved on, but you go back to the past, Matt Ryan, the Falcons moved on for him, replaced him with a cheap veteran in Marcus Mariota and a guy on a rookie contract in, in Desmond Ritter. Carson Wentz replaced by a guy on a rookie contract in Jalen Hurts. Jimmy Garoppolo replaced, potentially replaced by a guy like Trey Lance or Brock Purdy on a rookie contract. Joe Flacco replaced by Lamar Jackson on a rookie contract. Philip Rivers replaced by Justin Herbert on a rookie contract. And while, you know, Flacco, Rivers, and, and Ryan were sort of the old school guys, so it took a couple of years of them losing before the Ravens, the Falcons, and the Chargers looked to move on. 
But basically, Carson Wentz had one bad or Philly had one down year, one losing season, and then they were, he was out the door. Jimmy Garoppolo, one losing season in San Francisco, and they were trading up for Trey Lance and all that sort of stuff. And so basically, again, if you're not going to be a perennial playoff team, if you're ceiling or, or if you're a team that's like we are a playoff team, but our ceiling is a first or second round of the, of the playoffs, like, say, the Vikings are with Kirk Cousins, I think those teams are going to be more and more looking to move on and replace their really expensive 35 five 45 55 million dollar quarterbacks with guys on rookie contracts because again if you're not getting if you're not watching cable why are you paying for cable right cut the cord i think that's going to be the new normal in the nfl and that's part of the reason why i'm not necessarily panicking about the future of the falcons quarterback position because in the future where we do have to go out there and make that move to get that guy that can get us in the po postseason uh success if desmond ritter can't be the guy that can get us into the postseason well we'll be able to find a, a veteran stopgap option that we can rent for a year or two to get us into the postseason before we go back to making the switch to a good quarterback on a rookie contract or that sort of thing so you know, to me, my big question with Lamar is not, hey, you know, are you a quarterback that can get a team on perennial playoff? I think Lamar has proven without a doubt that he will get you in playoff contingent. My one question with Lamar is, is he the type of quarterback that can get you consistently past the first and second round of the playoffs? Right. And so, therefore, that's the question with paying him the premium. You know, are you going to be paying him, you know, 50 million plus dollars? And you're basically your ceiling is the second round of the playoffs. But, you know, we're not going to get into that. Uh, on today's episode, but we'll wrap up here. Um, you know, I, I feel like when we talk about the Falcon situation and you touched upon the Sandox, the Falcons from the jump, right? Arthur Smith, Terry Fontenot have from the jump been talking about, we want to improve the roster first and then worry about the quarterback later. And I think it's understandable why so many people poke holes in that type of strategy. Cause like any strategy in the NFL, you can poke holes in pretty much. There's no sort of tried and true one true blueprint to team success. But I do think a year from now where you presumably hope that the Falcons have a stronger core circling back and revisiting the quarterback conversation, such as pursuing Lamar Jackson does make a lot more sense. So that's part of the reason why I am not necessarily panicking about, Oh no, the Falcons have to get the quarterback this off season or else everything, you know, is going to fall apart. I, I just don't think that's going to be the, the case in the NFL that worrying about the quarterback position, like we have done for most of the last, you know, 20 years, I think just, it's a little less panic. That's all I'm saying. So we'll, we'll see if, if this prediction holds true in the next couple of years, you know, you, you'll see more and more of these, you know, cheaper rookie contracts and whatnot, but time will tell on that issue, but that is going to do it for us here on today's locked on Falcons tomorrow. I believe we'll be joined by Josh Kendall of the athletic and funny enough, we had Josh on like the Tuesday um, kicking off free agency last year. And that was the day where the news dropped that they were pursuing Deshaun Watson. So like I had recorded a full episode with Deshaun Watson or with Josh Kendall talking about, Oh, the Falcons gonna be quiet this uh, week in free agency. And uh, then 45 minutes later, uh, the Deshaun Watson news broke and I had to scrap that whole episode. So I'm kind of tempting fate to sort of see if we can have Josh on and then, you know, we'll see if a big move happens in that regard with the Falcons you shortly thereafter. So uh, that will be what you can expect on tomorrow's episode. Please make us your first listen for your second listen. Go and check out my Locked On NFL Draft Podcast. Damian Parson, Keith Sanchez of the Draft Network are providing that in-depth coverage of the top prospects, the deep dives into the sleepers, hitting gyms for your favorite team's fortunes. Uh, even if you're not necessarily loving the moves that the Falcons are making right now, Locked On NFL Draft on YouTube, uh, you know, check them out. Uh, find them wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.